Okay, so as we were <clears throat> discussing, let me share the screen. Last week, we started to talk about depreciation. And depreciation, <clears throat> as we had said, is <clears throat> accounting for the aging of assets. Right, so this is a more of a quote unquote theoretical um, type of uh, accounting where <clears throat> if you have an asset, we use the example here of a truck and it's on your balance sheet at the purchase price in this example, $20,000. The idea is by next year, that truck isn't worth $20,000. If somebody were, were to come around and buy it, say, they'll say, hey, that's not a, a new truck. You can't sell it for the same price that you bought it for. You've been using it. And so how do you account for the concept of, of, it, of, its, of its usage? That's depreciation. So we say in straight line depreciation, evenly spread out over time, that the usage of the truck um, is equally reduced every year. So we said in this example, or let me make a simpler example in this one for now. Let's say if the truck has a 20 year life and it's $20,000, that means its usage is 20,000 divided by 20, 1,000 every year. So let's say next week we've used $1,000 of its value. So that $1,000 gets expensed on the income statement <clears throat> and reduces your property value, your property value, your, your PP&E, your, your truck value, and so on, until you get to year 20, and the truck becomes zero. Now, in reality, <clears throat> there is something called a residual value or scrap value, where by year zero, that truck isn't worth zero, that truck is worth something, some sort of, you can trade it by the end of its depreciation life for scrap metal or, and let's say that that scrap value is, let's say a thousand dollars. So by year zero, it's not worth zero, it's worth a thousand dollars. Well, then when you're doing your depreciation calculation, you don't take your 20,000 divided by 20, you don't depreciate it by a thousand a year. Cause if you're depreciating it by a full thousand a year, then by year zero, it'll be zero. You're only going to depreciate the purchase price minus that residual value. So if the purchase price is 20,000, there's a thousand in scrap value. You're depreciating that different. 19,000 is depreciating. So you're depreciating 1900 each year, 1900, 1900. By the time you get to zero, it's going to be worth a thousand dollars. So the general formula for straight line depreciation is the purchase price minus the scrap value or the residual value divided by its life. That is the depreciation expense. Now, how do we model this out? <clears throat> well, let's go to our uh, um, model right now. And I just wanna kind of give a quick overview of, of where we are. And, and by the way, actually, um, what I wanna do is, um, I'm pretty happy with this. If, if you remember, we made our projections, okay? And what I wanna do is I wanna quickly go to, um, Yahoo Finance, because on February 2nd, I had mentioned that um, the company had released their annual report. So ideally we would use their new annual report, but you know, we're caught in the middle. We already started modeling off of 2019. So I'm not going to go back and, and undo everything that's gonna cause confusion. But what's interesting to know is, <clears throat> Their, their revenue, has this been updated? Their current year, sorry, this is their projected revenue. Where, where is their summary of, of what just happened here? I had, I had it pulled up um, over the weekend when I was kind of pining through this. Okay, so the 2020 revenue, 386064. Okay, we had projected it to be 380, pretty good. Pretty close. Their net income from continuing operations was okay. So I, I got to pull up the actual report, but 20, 25, 26. Hang on. I had it. I had it pretty close to matching. Let me let me get. I think what's happening here is 
we don't we we don't have our depreciation in here. We don't have interest. But when I put our when I put an expected depreciation in and expected interest in, it came pretty close. So our projections were sound. Is really what I'm trying to prove. Let's look at that again. Once we have depreciation in there, I had forgotten I'd taken it out for my for my personal analysis. I actually have the model a little bit further complete where I have depreciation in here, and I was able to tie it very closely to um, what what they actually came out. So the way I'm guiding you with the projections is actually coming out to fruition with what they're producing, which I think should give uh, everyone good good confidence. And remember, we got these projections by looking at what the analysts on the street had done. So. <clears throat> I had forgotten here, I'd removed depreciation. We're not that far along. We're gonna talk about that now. Now, we have made our projections all the way down to depreciation. We did not put our depreciation in here. We need to, right? Um, we then projected down, did not put in interest expense, interest income. That's gonna come from the debt schedule, right? Projected down as far as we could went to the cash flow statement, projected as, as, as much as we could. We pulled net income from the income statement. We pulled depreciation from the income statement. Remember, depreciation is zero here because it has not been full, filled in in the income statement. And then deferred income taxes, we're gonna talk about it. It often comes from the income statement. Sorry, the depreciation schedule. We're gonna talk about that, whether we get to it this week, if not next week. Working capital line items come from the working capital schedule. That's going to be the next schedule we talk about after depreciation. And then we projected investing activities and financing activities. Um, <clears throat> this, the anything related to debts will come from the debt schedule. Okay, so now here we are. We are we're at a roadblock where we got a lot of holes. We got a couple holes in the income statement, mainly depreciation, interest income. We got a lot of holes here. The next big schedule is the balance sheet. But what I recommend is let's fill in the depreciation and working capital schedules in order to best give us projections for our balance sheet. Okay. So next let's look at the depreciation schedule and working capital schedule. Now, side modeling note is our depreciation schedule uses property, plant, and equipment. Property, plant, and equipment is a balance sheet line item. So we got to look to the balance sheet for our first starting point. Let's open up Amazon report. We're going to go to our financial data. And we're going to pull up the balance sheet for the first time. Now, we didn't learn about the balance sheet yet. We're just going to kind of glance at it. It's actually nicely laid out. It's nice and simple. We're going to talk about balance sheet as a statement of the assets that the company owns, the liabilities, what it owes, and then equity. Equity is stock, preferred stock. And we'll talk about that. But here we get a good picture of how much property is, is up, is um. Uh, is the, the company owns and here property and equipment 72705. We are going to use that to create our depreciation schedule. Now thinking ahead, what I like to do, so this is all old uh, items from our from our templates. So I'm going to delete all of this. Okay. Whoops. We're gonna talk about why that says yes, balances. <clears throat> what I like to do to be simple is I'm going to, even though we haven't done the balance sheet yet, just thinking ahead, I'm going to, if we're gonna use this property, plant and equipment number, 72705, to start our depreciation schedule, I'm gonna hard code it into its respective position. This is where I want the, the original property, plant, and equipment to live. This is where it starts. If I put it on the depreciation schedule, then I have to link it back to the balance sheet in the hard-coded section, and it's kind of like working backwards. So even though I don't recommend to build out the balance sheet yet, 
because we're going to need the cash flow statement to drive the balance sheet and we don't have a complete cash flow statement yet. I want this number. So let me put this number in here while I can. 72705. Okay. It saves me the trouble later. And so this will start our depreciation schedule. See what I'm saying here? So the depreciation schedule starts with our property, plant, and equipment. If I were to hard code it here, then later I'd have to link it back to the hard coded section of the balance sheet, which is a little bit counterintuitive. Another thing I could have done, although it makes it confusing in the book, this is why I'm doing it this way. Another thing I could have done is fine, just lay out all your balance sheet hard codes for now. Don't project it yet though, but that's fine. Okay, let's look at this depreciation schedule. Now the depreciation schedule is split up into two major sections. You have your straight line depreciation, assuming that Amazon uses the method of straight line depreciation most companies do, and we're gonna prove it in a second. And then you have accelerated depreciation. We're gonna talk about accelerated depreciation. Actually, um, <clears throat> where I'm not gonna use accelerated depreciation for Amazon, um, they do several other things, which we'll talk about, but I want accelerated depreciation to stay in this model because I want to teach it to you, even though we're not going to actually use it to value Amazon. Okay. And so <clears throat> I want to talk about how straight line depreciation works, but I first want to prove to you how I know that Amazon uses straight line depreciation. And when we do a quick word search, I'm not, I think this is the one that's not searchable. Okay, so this is the not searchable. We'll go back to Amazon here. The 10K is, for some reason, there is a glitch in that PDF. Okay. And I would, although most of the time, whoops, companies use straight line depreciation you want to double check. Okay. We do word search on depreciation and they will talk about it. There we go. Property, plant, and equipment. There you go. Depreciation and amortization is recorded on a straight line basis. There you go. Over the estimated useful lives of the assets. Now, getting the useful lives of those assets is the second challenge. We're going to talk about that afterwards. I first want to go through the mechanics of how to build out a depreciation schedule, and then we'll figure that out. Okay, but now we've proven that they do, in fact, use straight line depreciation. So we're going to use the method of straight line depreciation to build out the model. Now, Tricky part about depreciation because let's just assume for simplicity that um, we're going to use 10 years. I always just use that as a nice round number. Very simple. If the, if the, if the company's property is 70, $72 billion and it's a 10 year depreciation, you take 72 divided by 10. That's the depreciation or $7.2 billion. And that's the depreciation expense that will happen each year. Right. And so, the model, the, uh, the form has been started for you where it says existing PPE, the depreciation on the existing PPE is, and I'll show you how they did that, equals 72,705 divided by 10, right? That's the depreciation. That depreciation will happen every single year. Now, quick modeling note. If I copy this to the right, I get a zero. Why do I get a zero? Because the references to my formula has shifted. That's the way when you copy right, the references to my formula shifts. Well, in this depreciation schedule, the way we're gonna create it, you, don't, you do not want those references to shift. You want to anchor those references. You want it to always say G6 divided by G9. Now, one way to do it, which to me is cheating, you can go equal to the year before. Right? But I like a more robust method, and it's good to have you understand how to anchor cell references. If you go up to the references and put dollar signs around references, it anchors the reference. 
So if I go into that formula, double click, and I go dollar G and dollar G, that anchors the reference to G. That says when I copyright, don't change G, keep G, G. Copy to the right. Look at that. It'll always reference, then that's what we want. Because this is indicating how I calculated this. It is G6 divided by G9. <clears throat> now, That is the depreciation on the existing property, plant, and equipment. But something else gets depreciated here, which we didn't talk about. Your capital expenditures. The capital expenditures is the improvement on your property. So if you were to build 22 or improve the value of $22 billion in property, that's going to depreciate as well. So the complexity in the depreciation schedule is with each cash flow coming in, you're going to have depreciation on that. And that depreciation is going to accumulate. That's why we have to build a schedule to manage the accumulation of that depreciation and manage it properly in tandem with the property that's being acquired and built. So when you have capital expenditures coming in, that needs its own depreciation. Now, this G7 is, is, um, uh, is hard coded template. We got to change that. This depreciation, need, all right, this CapEx needs to come in from our cash flow statement. Okay, now if I link this in from the CapEx and our cash flow statement here, it's going to come in as negative. I don't want it to be negative, I want it to be positive. So I need to link this in as a positive number. So I'm going to go minus which is gonna change that negative back to a positive. Go to the cash flow statement, select my CapEx. Here we go. Copy this to the right. And I'm gonna change this to black font because it's a formula. This is my CapEx. This CapEx needs to also be depreciated, okay? And so one thing I want to do is I want to make my model a little bit more robust. This is a template. Th these years, okay, I want to um, separate out the property, plant, and equipment years from the CapEx years. I'm going to show you what I mean. So I'm going to add a row above row 10, okay? I'm going to go shift space bar, control shift plus, twice, control shift plus. So what I want to do is I want to clearly define the years on my PP&E, or let me just property, plant, and equipment, and the years on my CapEx. The reason why I'm doing this is because sometimes the CapEx will depreciate at a different life than the property, plant, and equipment. Okay. So in other words, this 10 that I used to calculate my PP&E, I'm going to cut control X and put into my property, plant, and equipment years. Make sure it still links. That's the years based on my property, plant, and equipment. The years I'm going to use to depreciate my CapEx is going to be underneath. I'm going to hard code 10. Copy that to the right. So I've clearly separated out. I've clearly separated out the depreciation on that net property because I want the versatility to be able to depreciate them differently. And then I'm just going to, as a formatting um, technical piece. I want to add one more row above row 12 and I want to call it actually depreciation. Right. I've, I've created a section, just the years and the depreciation. Pre -C okay. Depreciation on that. Okay. 
So you can see the formula has already been started for you, but it needs a bit of adjusting. Now I want to depreciate the value of that CapEx. If that capital expenditure, if that property is going to come in in 2020, that depreciation is going to start in 2020 and will continue for the next 10 years. So I'm going to delete this formula and show you how to do it. So it's going to be equal to capital expenditures divided by the now the CapEx 10. That way I can manage it differently. I want to anchor these references. Dollars in front of the Gs. Copy to the right. Okay, so what's happening is if I total this at the bottom, and I'll do an alt equals, okay? If I total this at the bottom, what I really have, and I'll copy this to the right, I'll really have depreciation on the property, plant, and equipment, and depreciation on the capital expenditures that's coming in in 2020. Gets tricky. It's going to get trickier. In 2021, In 2021, I have oops, depreciation. Oh, sorry. In 2021, I have built even new equipment. Sorry, more property. I've improved my property further. I have depreciation on that. You have to think about a timeline. This year's gone now, let's say. Let's say we're in this year now. In this year, we have the depreciation from 2020 on our property. We have the depreciation from 2020 on that CapEx that year. Now we have depreciation in 2021 on the new property built in 2021. So that's gonna start here. So here we have to create a new formula to represent our 2021 CapEx. I know it's confusing. You just gotta kind of go through it and rewind and go through this which will be equal to 27 billion divided by the 10 that I've put here. I put it created a separate 10 for each uh, property build. Anchor it, copy to the right. <clears throat> so now if you look at my 2021 depreciation, I have the 7270 on the net property, the 2284 on the, the last year's cat in inflow. 27 on this year's cash flow. So next year, next year, I have 7220 from the property plant equipment in 2020, 2284 from, 2000, from now two years ago's property improvement, 2720 from last year's property improvement. On top of it, I'm going to have the new flow based on the new property improvement. It's going to continue to stack. This will equal to 29 billion anchor divided by 10 anchor that. So each year I'm stacking depreciation on the prior depreciations. Next year, I copy this to the right. I have even more. 2023, I have 30 billion in property improvements. My depreciation is going to be a total accumulation of the 7 billion on the original property, the 22 on the capex from 2020, the 27 on the 2021 capex, 29 on last year's capex, and then I'm going to have the new depreciation on the new cash flow. and so on. I'm going to do this faster, but you can watch the video after. You can sense the pattern here. Okay, so it's always from above. Whoops. <clears throat> and it's because it's straight line, it stays flat. 32. Bye. -bye. To the right. And then finally, 32. 
I'm not copying this, so anchors are not completely necessary, but just for the sake of consistency. And there you go. That's our depreciation. Okay. This will now get linked back into our income statement and then into our cash flow statement. This is our depreciation. So we go to the income statement, scroll up, take our 2020 depreciation, link in, but hit G32, hit equal sign, depreciation, take the 9555, enter, copy to the right. Now our depreciation has been populated. We can remove the highlight from here. No fill. And this should flow into our cash flow statement, which it does, and trickle down. Now, look what's happening here. A nice climb here, a nice consistent climb. 11, 15, 21, boom, drops. What's happening? Doesn't seem consistent. Did they say it would drop? What would drop depreciation? Maybe a huge sell-off of property? They don't have that. It's a problem with our assumptions. Namely, it's a problem with the fact that we've just used 10 years hard-coded here. Now, this is the tricky part. What, at what rate do we depreciate our equipment? Straight line means to depreciate it even, evenly. Okay, well, that's step one. We know how to depreciate evenly, but how many years? If you go back to the note that we've uncovered, it says depreciation and amortization is recorded on a straight line basis over the estimated useful lives of the asset. Generally, the lesser of 40 years or three years for their servers, five years for networking equipment, 10 years for heavy equipment, three to seven years for other fulfillment equipment. Okay, so what does that mean? It's a blend. There's that 72, $72 billion consists of a lot of different pieces of property. It consists of underlying buildings that have 40 years of a useful life, servers that have three years of useful life, network equipment, five years, heavy equipment, three to seven, um, 10 years. It's a blend. We've put 10 in there, but it's a blend of anything from three to 40. You're gonna find this in almost every company. So what do you use? Well, there's a couple problems here. I know some people think, well, you can go get a schedule and table of how much property they have outstanding and do the math. And they, they, I think Amazon does have a table where they break out. Well, it's not that explicit, but a lot of companies have a table where they break out. Well, th this is the assets of our underlying buildings. This is the networking assets. And then you can do the math and get a blended rate. However, there's a second problem to depreciation. This number, $72 billion, is not the purchase price of those assets. If you were to look at a table of the value of the underlying equipment and the years of useful life, they're going to give you the purchase price. That's not going to tie back to the $72 billion because the $72 billion is the purchase price after all of that accumulation, accumulated depreciation to date. This is the net value, not the gross. So what's inconsistent about taking and looking at the original value of properties and their useful lives is you don't know when that asset has been purchased and how long it's been depreciating for. The only way to get to an exact year to continue your depreciation is to have a depreciation schedule built for every piece of property from the day it was purchased way back in time. You're not going to get that. You need an implied net blended rate. Well, guess what? You're never going to get that. It's impossible. Unless you're maybe in the accounting department at the company and have historical data going all the way back to the original purchase price of every single company, of every single property from 1997. Somebody probably has that. Not practical for an analyst. 
What is practical though, is to understand the trend of depreciation, to understand the method, and to understand that I need to at least adhere to the historical trends using all the information that's given. And so what I'm gonna do, you don't have to do this part. What I'm gonna show you is what I mean, is I just wanna pull in for illustration, last year's depreciation and the year before and the year before. And I wanna show you what's happening in terms of growth. Why the, our trends are not, are not accurate right now. So I'm gonna take 2018, divide by 2017 minus one, copy to the right. Now two things are happening. First of all, they had quite a big jump here, 30%, 40%. We have quite a drop, okay, let me get this into percentages. We have a 50% drop. And then we have 20% climbing each year. Now, when thinking about growth going forward, growth going forward should really be commensurate with our CapEx growth. Okay, what is our CapEx growth? 20%, okay. The growth historically, I mean, I, I'll be honest here, th this jump is a little bit aggressive, 40%. I don't expect 40%. I know they had a lot of back uh, acquisitions in the past, but if the growth of CapEx is 20%, I would think at least a 20% growth is gonna be more accurate going forward. Okay. Um, I wanna show you another trick for understanding what future depreciation is. is. Um, now, let's assume, of course, we can go to the annual report, right? Now that the annual report is out, but the odds of an annual report being out while you're modeling is gonna be very slim. So uh, I had modeled this in advance and without the annual, without the annual report of having come out and came very close. And the reason why I came very close is, um, a trick is to estimate what the depreciation should be is, go to the last um, quarterly report, look at its quarterly depreciation and multiply by four. Here we go, depreciation. 2020, six, five, okay. Should be about 27 billion, right? Times four, 26. So 65, 65, 23 times four, 26 billion. So that's a good trick, at least as a first cut. And here it says that they, they had for 12 months, they had 23. This is another way of looking at it. They had 23 billion in depreciation from January to September. Plus, let's say they get 6 billion in that last quarter, that's that's 29 billion. It's another way of looking at it. So 26 to 29 billion is what you should be targeting for year end depreciation. So that's a that's a that's a probably accurate jump from 21 billion. How do you do that? Well, you can do all your back end math of calculating years, et cetera, that you want. But to order, in order to get an appropriate trend, in order to get this number up, we have to drop our property, plant, and equipment years. If we drop it from 10 to nine, nine billion goes up. Drop it from nine to eight, goes up. Let's go to seven, goes up, not enough. Drop to five, not enough. Drop to three, there's your 26 billion. That's the way to do it. Drop your useful life, okay? To get your actual book depreciation up. Or increase your useful life to get the total depreciation down. So there's, remember I mentioned we should be projecting about 20% because that's what we calculated on our CapEx growth. 
looks okay. Now, what about going forward? Going forward, it's increasing by 10%. I think it should be a little bit higher. I think it should be commensurate with the CapEx growth. So if this growth is too low, let's drop this down to seven. Let's see what that does. Better. What happens to five? Let's stick with seven for now. Now remember that pops this up a little bit. This gives us a much better and smoother projection in depreciation. And we could tweak this as we go on. Right now, 2020 came out, and I think that the depreciation was about 29 billion. Right. Um, now I can look at analyst reports for 2021. As you build your model, you can go out and, and, and improve and tweak its assumptions. But this is the way to do it. You can do all the back end uh, weighted averaging and things I've seen analysts do for depreciation scheduling to make projections. But unless you have a, a, a measure of every single property that the company's had since its acquisition, since its you know first acquisition of the property, you're never going to get a, an accurate value of number. What you want to do though is tweak those numbers, tweak the life in order to back into expected growth. Okay. So that's our depreciation numbers for now. That will flow into our income statement. That will flow into our cash flow statement. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, the next thing I want to introduce. Okay. Whoops. This is my solution. The next thing I want to introduce is the, the concept of accelerating depreciation. Oops. But I do want to say this. Um, we're not going to actually model this. We're going to model this, but we're actually we're not actually going to let this flow into the into the cash flow statement of the company because Amazon does not do it this way. Um, and I want to talk about that. Let's talk about that Monday because we're gonna we're gonna hit a wall in terms of the time I have on Zoom, and I'm going to be halfway through this conversation. So on Monday, I want to talk about accelerating depreciation. Um, and then we're going to shift over to the working capital schedule, which is very important. We're going to build the working capital schedule, link that into the cash flow statement, complete the cash flow statement, build the balance sheet. We'll have a fully projected balance sheet, calculate the debt schedule, and we'll be ready to value our company. All right, guys. I'm going to record this, pop this up. Thank you for your time.